I'm going to officially call our meeting to order at 6.35, and um, we have need of an executive session to discuss strategy with respect to negotiations with non-unit personnel, the assistant superintendent, as well as to comply with or act under the authority of Mass General Law specific to the review of executive session minutes for the meetings of October 19, 2017, November 16, 2018. Um, nope, that's probably 2017, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, December, 7, December 18th, 2017, January 1st, 2018, and February 1st, 2018, and we will reconvene in open session. So I just need a motion. So, second. And a second, okay. So a motion by um, Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Kavanaugh. Jen? Yes. Mina? Yes. John? Yes. Nancy? Yes. And I'm a yes. So we will move into executive session and we will return. Hello and welcome to the February 15th regular meeting of the Hawkington School Committee. We actually opened our meeting at 6.35 and went into executive session and we have exited out obviously for the purposes of rejoining the regular meeting. So I will start the meeting by asking you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, so I will just run quickly through the agenda and we will get started. Uh, so as I said, we started the meeting in executive session. Um, we will start our meeting tonight with recognitions, and we have quite a, a big group from the Youth and Philanthropy Program that we're very excited about. Uh, then we will have our first opportunity for public comment. Following that, we'll have reports to the school committee. Um, we'll have a student council report, assuming that the, the kids remember that we're at HCAM, <laughs> and um, the superintendent's report, school committee chair report, and then we'll have liaison reports. Under new business, we'll discuss the Business Professional of America Club overnight travel request, the superintendent's um, retirement notification letter, a request by the superintendent for a medical leave, and um, an appointment for an acting superintendent. We'll discuss the Director of Student Services contract, and we will also um, hear budget project projections for the next several years and consider that in the context of our ongoing conversation around the FY19 budget and capital projects. Um, under old business, we will take a look at our 2018 final international travel approval for our trips to Scotland and England, as well as our trip to Iceland. Following that, we'll have our final opportunity for public comment, followed by items by consensus, and it's our goal to adjourn by 8.50. So we'll see how we do with that. Mm -hmm. um, so without further ado, I, we could start off recognitions by, um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to invite up Renee Quinn from the um, Foundation for Metro West. And do you want to join her, Kelly? Yeah. And Kelly Nolan from um, the Hopkinton Charitable Trust. So come on up and tell us about the program. And then I know we have some shining stars here that can tell us about their experience. Um, I'm not expecting to speak. Oh, pressure. <laughs> We're <gonna laughs> Surprise. Have just take it away. Um, well, uh, again, my name is Renee Quinn. I'm with the Foundation for Metro West. And I'm Kelly Nolan. I'm a consultant to the Hoppington Country Club Charitable Foundation. Yeah, so um, just to give you a little bit of a quick synopsis of what, you know, YIP is. Um, YIP has been around for approximately 20 years. Well, actually more than 20 years this year. We're um, approaching our 21st anniversary. And Youth in Philanthropy is a leadership development program that focuses on community philanthropy. Um, and so we're really engaging young people on what it takes to give back um, and to serve their communities. And um, whether that's nonprofit related, civic engagement, um, really just trying to wrap their heads around like what it takes to make our communities the special places that they are. Um, but then to also get kids to start thinking about um, how fortunate we are and where we live and the things we get to experience and how they um, too can go out and empower those that might not be as fortunate. But um, I know Kelly will talk a little bit about the Hopkinton. No, and I, and I would say from the Hopkinton perspective, it was something where, you know, we had conducted the Charitable Foundation having been conducting traditional car washes and different fundraisers. And, and it just felt like there was something more to be done. And so yeah. part of what I set out to do was to identify a, a program that existed 
in our area um, that brought um, a way for young people to find their identity in philanthropy, mm -hmm. yeah. to not just think about just fundraising or not just think about just grant making, because they do $10,000 in grant making, but to also understand the definitions of civic engagement, the different roles that they can play, what a nonprofit leader goes through in terms of managing yeah. all of those efforts. Um, understanding the kinds of questions you ask and the interaction with nonprofit leaders. And so getting not only the landscape picture, but also a sense of self and where they might see themselves in the future and, and what, what makes them tick. Um, for my daughter, it was volunteering and, and be rolling up her sleeves with a nonprofit, and for others, it might be you know, doing grant making and strategic grant making work and partnering in that way. And so this program brought that together. It was something that the Hopkinton Country Club Charitable Foundation wanted to get behind and support, and so we have helped to fund the program for the last three years um, and then allow the, yeah. the Foundation for Mes Metro West program to you know, really be brought to our town. Well, thank you. I had the opportunity to go to the um, graduation, I think it was. Yeah. I missed the grant defense. I went to the graduation. And it really is such a robust program, and I know we've had tremendous participation from Hopkinton, and so I know you have some friends with you. If you want to introduce them and just maybe one or two of you tell us a little bit about your experience and what this program is, has meant for you, that would be great. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I know that Priya is ready um, to present, so I'll have great. her introduce herself, talk a little bit about the experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> um, my name is Priya Hegday, and I am a junior here at Hopkinton High School. And I was part of our fall youth cohort here in Hopkinton. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about our experience and the two organizations that we decided to fund and how we went about doing that. Great. Um, so through YIP, we've learned a lot about how nonprofits work and the services that they are able to bring to our community. And we also got to actually get involved and give back ourselves through both monetary donations and actually getting to go visit some organizations ourselves, which was very cool. Um, so going on these site visits, I think, was one of my personal favorite parts of this experience because we got to see firsthand how these nonprofits function and how the, like, board members are able to interact and how they actually serve people in our local community. And we were also ourselves able to create a board, make decisions, like work together, um, raise $5,000. Um, wow. No, raise $1,000 and we donated 5000 to each of these two organizations. And it felt really good overall. Um, so the actual organizations that we decided to fund um, one of them was Jeff's Place, who are located in Framingham, but they're open to basically anybody in the Metro West community. And they have essentially created a bi-monthly program where they offer grief counseling to local youth. And obviously grief is and like loss is something that is very experienced in our community. And I didn't realize this until like actually interacting with this organization. So that was something that I thought was very interesting. And what this program does is foster healthy grief for local youth. And it's really important because obviously these kids are going to grow up and live their lives. And they could be extremely affected if they don't learn how to grieve the right way. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the organizations that we donated $5,000 to. And the other one was um, Hope and Comfort. And they are based in Newton, but serve the Metro West community as a whole again by giving personal hygiene products to youth who are unable to access them themselves. And we immediately resonated with this need for personal hygiene because we realized that it really is an everyday must and people's self-confidence may suffer without it. And we also identified with health in general as a priority because it can impact performance in school and obviously, since we're in high school, we realize that it can be difficult already without having to worry about personal <laughs> hygiene. Right. Um, so because funding would go towards the purchase of additional products, we really felt that we could make a difference. And through YIB, we were able to do just that. And it was overall a great experience. Excellent. Thank you. Is 
anybody have questions? I have one question. Uh, yeah. First of all, Priya, very exciting that all of you are doing this. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, both the organization that you talked about, they seem to be doing something so unique. Um, yeah. And so what was that process? You know, how, do, how did you decide on these two organizations? Can you share a little bit about that? Did you have yeah. other organizations that you were considering? Yeah. So basically, the foundation gave us seven to eight grants to look at. And our task was to basically choose one youth development and one economic assistance grant that we would um, give money to, essentially. And as a group, we first went around, like, we all read through the grants, and we decided, like, which ones we liked more, which ones we didn't, and we kind of talked it out that way to see, like, if we were all on the same page. And from that point, we decided, like, where we would want to go on site visits to, to actually see firsthand what they're all about. And we ended up picking two organizations that we really liked and two that we weren't sure about for that, just so we could like confirm our feelings towards some of them and see if we were missing out on others. And I think that also really impacted us because um, actually Jeff's place was one of the ones that we visited. And I know I was kind of on the fence after reading the grant, but like definitely visiting changed my mind. So that was a valuable experience. And from there, we all kind of came to a consensus pretty quickly, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great job. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Do you want to introduce your partners here? Yeah. You guys want to come on. How are we going to do this? <laughs> or not. Oh, no. We don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. All right. Uh, <coughs> sure. Okay. Oh, we actually have two of our co-chairs here, so. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we'd just love to meet you and, and know your names and say, you know, thank you for all the work that you're doing. And All right, hi, I'm Alex, and I was one of the co-chairs for the fall session. And I'm Raymond Lucas, and I was the other co-chair of our YIP group. And, yeah, so that that's us. <laughs> yeah. uh, any questions? Anything? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I am Lesa Thicke. I was just a member, but I had a lot of fun. Too. Just a member. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Justin Armando. I was the treasurer for the group. Excellent. Hi, Justin. I'm Nick Skiba, and I was also just a member. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just a member, too. I so just, right. like, we're all just yeah, members exactly. of a... We're right. Right. We've all got our spots. That's right. We're all just members of a different kind right. of a nonprofit sitting up here, right? right? But I also know it's it's competitive to get into these in the philanthropy group. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's an application So there's process. not just a member. You That's guys have right. done tremendous work and worked hard even to get in. So it, yeah, congratulations. it's a lot of work. Well, and thank you both, too, you. for helping. I mean, it's so great to give just concrete, real-world <coughs> experience to the next generation of philanthropists yeah. um, and you know so thank you for bringing the program to Hawkinton I was so excited when I heard about this program so thank you all for indulging me but I really wanted to have them come and be able to tell us a little bit more about what they've been doing and it's just another of an endless series of examples that we see here at this table <coughs> of the breadth of um, of things that our students do that go f so far beyond the school day and so far beyond academics that you know, not only round out who you are as a person, but just really are such a credit to the experience that you're having in the high school and such a support to our town. So honestly, for all of you, thank you so much for doing this. And we're really proud to have you here. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll see some similar, can you do it two years in a row? Or are we gonna see new faces next year? Um, what you can do face. after uh, Youth and Philanthropy is to apply to become part of the new junior board they have. Oh, awesome. So that's another way you can stay connected with the Foundation of Metro West. And something that one of my friends did, she did Youth and Philanthropy in the spring, and she applied for a teacher's assistant position for this fall. So she was able to do that. Um, you can only do youth philanthropy once, like I said, but there's so many other things you could do within the foundation, so it never really ends after you. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much, and I know it's only one more day for vacation, but you're welcome to stay tonight, <laughs> but I'm sure you have some studying to do for tomorrow, so you're welcome to stay, but don't feel like you have to, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much to all of you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so next is our first opportunity for public comment, and unless any of our youth and philanthropy students have something on their mind, I don't think we have anybody here for public comment. So um, 
nor do we have anybody here for student council. So next up is um, the superintendent's report. Are you ready? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So I'm actually um, uncharacteristically going to read my report tonight um, because it, it really focuses on um, the tragic events in Florida. And um, dear Hopkinton families and educators, the entire country is once again in shock as we react to another deadly school shooting. While we share our heartbreak over the tragic loss of life, we are also desperate to understand and do everything possible to protect our own community. In the coming days, I will work with our community leaders to provide information on the safety measures currently in place in our schools and to identify areas where we can continue to improve as a community. As district leaders, we've spent many hours in training and attended numerous safety summits to learn as much as we can from other senseless tragedies. As a community, we must unite to work together on mental health awareness and alerting each other to anything that appears to be out of the ordinary. We also need to ensure that our students are emotionally safe in relation to news after the shooting. Parents or staff, as always, with immediate concerns about safety should feel free to contact building principals for school-specific questions, but I wanted to take the opportunity tonight um, to let the school committee know that it's my intention to work with other uh, public safety community members, administrators, parents, to join forces um, around some of the issues that, that I just talked about um, and, and continue to provide not only as much information as we can. I think we've gotten to a point where public safety is something um, and school safety and what we have in place, we need to share. Um, people need to know uh, the safety measures that are already there. And if Florida is an example, no amount of planning could have prevented that situation. However, there are other things that we can do and we talk about doing and there's so many strengths that we have as a community that I think um, as we've unfortunately learned so much about what we're doing around school safety has been what we learned from other tragedies like the one in Florida. And so I wanted to make it my focus for tonight's report because I don't want anybody in any way to think that that was just another incident and we're, we'll chalk it up to another incident. I think that we need to continue to pay attention and let them inform us and learn as a community about how we can continue. So there will be a forum. There's already a meeting plan for next week um, to include police, fire, um, our emergency services, uh, community members, school committee, um, where we'll be looking at identifying areas that the community wants to know about, areas where we really need to work together to improve. Um, and I will be communicating to the school community um, a letter from my office um, tomorrow. So I don't know if there's any comments. It's not really something that we were prepared to discuss tonight, but I did want to let you know that. Well, thank you. I think, I mean, first of all, just for acknowledging it, it's, you know, and I think for providing this opportunity as well, because I'm sure we all have had the same experience today and yesterday as we walked through our day and, you know, just everywhere, social media, I would say Colella's, but wherever you happen to be, um, you know, people are talking about it. And I think, um, you know, as you said, there's, there's never ever, you can't, plan for every single eventuality but the more you prepare uh, the better off you are and I think and part of that is just I think people feel a need to have a conversation a public conversation yeah. about yeah. their concern and, and want to know I think we all have great faith in our district administration and our police and our fire but just to hear from them directly and also feel like if there's a way they can be part of the, the conversation that they want to be so I think yeah. providing that opportunity is is a great next step. So thank I mean, you. The Im thank you, Jean. The images are just too fresh, aren't they, from what we just went through as a, what ended up being a drill in our <clears> community. <throat> but for students who are watching that drill, 
um, and I have heard from some, some um, middle school parents, um, it's terrifying. And I think the more we've reached a point, in my opinion, where the more we share about our safety procedures, I no longer believe that holding them back provides any additional level of security. I think people need to be reassured of everything that we have in place. So, um, thank you. Thank so, you. Can I, so, first of all, again, thank you for, for raising this. And I feel like for the past three years, Ish, we have been having these discussions about school safety and security. I, I, as somebody who was one of the proponents of keeping as much of this in executive session as possible, I, I agree with your your change in direction. Yeah. Um, I think it's important. Um, I think it's important that the community know that the school district, the police force, the fire department, the emergency response are taking action. Yeah. I think the thing that you hear, and I promise I'm not going into a long political diatribe here, is that people want action. Mm -hmm. As you said, this can't be lost in another story. No. And we can't believe that this can't happen in Hopkinton because if you look at the communities where it's happened, they're not always that different than ours. Mm -hmm. And so I am certainly a proponent of reasonable safety measures within our school, but there is a lot that's been done over the last three years, and I think that it would be really helpful. Um, to share that. So I appreciate your, your positioning there and, and yeah. your communication. Um, I would also say to the community, as it relates more to the incident that happened at our high school and what, what happens in the community and on social media in some of those conversations, we have an incredibly dedicated public safety staff, which I include the school administration in. Yeah. Decisions are made on the fly. Decisions are made through sound discussion and collaboration. It is not always possible to alert the community to every decision that is made and why it is made in real time. Yeah. The focus needs to be on student safety. And I get very frustrated when I hear people question those decisions yeah. who are outside of those buildings. Mm -hmm. To me, if you don't have faith in the decisions that are made by the superintendent of schools, the high school principal, the chief of police, and the fire chief in these situations, then you probably need to look at whether or not this is the right town for you to live in. We have exceptional staff, and I think they need to be given the latitude to make the decisions that they make without constant criticism. And wasn't planning on saying that tonight, but it just somewhat inspired me to do that. So thank you for that, and um, hopefully we can continue this conversation as a community. Thank you, John. I, I, just one last comment based on something that you said that I think is important to say out loud, and that is it can also get lost in these kinds of situations in what should be happening in the country. And that, that does us no good. <laughs> There's not, we don't have any control over that. What we do have control over is what we can do right here. And, um, and I think that this has unfortunately reminded us that there's more that can be done and we will not waste any time moving forward with that so thank you. i don't mean to be repetitive to a lot of sentiment that we all are feeling but two things that you brought out which resonate very well with me and i want to point out is the mental health aspect of it that if you see something which yeah. say something yeah. i think and and be supportive about it um, and offer help and suggest a few things I, I think that's very very important yeah. not just in schools but in the community itself right. this is a very complex issue we, we all know that um, and, and the second thing that you talked about having a forum and being open and you know being there for one another listening caring and you know understanding things together yeah. as to what's going in if if someone has an anxiety about something that's real that yes. that's their anxiety you know some of us react to situations differently than others yeah. And that doesn't mean we can write off someone else's anxiety. So those forums hopefully will give that opportunity for people to understand all the work that goes in yes. and that it is not easy, um, you know, some of those decisions that are made and uh, how you go about it. So I think that will help uh, a lot. Yes. So thank you for bringing that yeah, up. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Okay. okay.
Do you have more to your report? All I want to say is that next week is February vacation <laughs> uh, for our students and our teachers. And um, it's always kind of that point in the year. It feels like a turning point where winter is over and we cross our fingers that there won't be any more snow days, Dr. Kavanaugh. And, um, but it does almost, it feels like spring is around the corner and there seems to be a lift whenever we get back from February vacation, this positive energy. Um, it's just, it, it is a really nice turning point in the year, always. And we let all the flu germs out. We do, yeah. exactly. We do. <laughs> Disinfect that Dis place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so for the school committee chair report, first I'll just update you that I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 18-052, 18-053, 18-054, and 18-055. All warrants have been included in your packet. I also have approved for payment the payroll warrant S18016, and all, approved, all warrants have been included in your packet. Um, in addition to that, I will share with you that I received a couple of emails um, to the school committee this week. One was a series of suggestions for um, should we need to make further reductions to the budget, suggested areas that we could look at. So I forwarded that to Dr. McLeod and Ms. Rothermick for them to review as part of our ongoing work with the FY19 budget. And in addition, I wanted to make sure that you all had received the um, letter or were made aware of the letter that a number of our local legislators, including Carolyn Dykema, who is the one that sent it to me, have sent to um, Karen Spilka and Jeffrey Sanchez, who are the chair of um, Ways and Means, um, requesting an, a supplemental um, circuit breaker funding for FY19 to bring the circuit breaker funding back up to the 75%. So I don't know, you I'm sure both know better than I do the timing of how these processes work and whether or not we're going to have any answer to that in time to impact the budget discussions that we're having with the Board of Selectmen, but I did want to just um, make you aware of that. Did you guys all get this? If not, I'll forward it to you from Carolyn Dykema's office. So I'll forward it to you, and I just mostly wanted to say, you know, as always, our, our local legislators are absolutely tremendous advocates for us. So I just, that jumped out to me as a perfect example of them being proactive. That's based on conversations. Nancy and I cornered her in a parking lot um, not long ago and uh, started by innocently chatting and asking about her kids and went right into how critical a need we have for supplemental circuit breaker funding. So, um, and I know we're not the only ones and I just really wanted to say that they really um, are very, very responsive and advocate strongly on our behalf. So I thought that that was outstanding. And then um, I also did receive another email just as I was walking into um, the meeting that was related to uh, one of our later new business items about Dr. Zalewski's contract. So I'll just wait until we get to that point to um, fill you in on that. So that is all I have for my report. Um, and we can start with liaison reports if anybody has. Do you have any? Sure, I'll start. Yeah. Um, we had a, an elementary school building committee meeting on the 12th, so whatever that was, Monday, I think. Um, and the new building is now 86% complete, wow. which is a, yeah, a wow. pretty, pretty cool number to hear. Um, so uh, they are, um, and, and the list of things that are ongoing is long, so I won't bore you with that, but the fact that it's 86% complete, this is the home stretch. Um, there's, there's a few concerns going on with the tiling going on in the building, um, but the, the contractor, um, is a little behind schedule with it, but you, that's probably the biggest concern that was brought up in the me meeting, and they're still ahead of schedule. So, even though that you know could potentially slow things down a little bit, they're still ahead of schedule. So, the concern is at least at this point not dire. Um, and then th there was co the conversation began f um, just just started um, concerning the ribbon cutting. And the farewell to center school. So things are, it's the home stretch um, for, the, for the marathon school completion, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that's just sort of a gloss over, but yeah, there's a lot going on over there. That's very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a small update on, uh, you know, a conversation that I had with Ashok about uh, the school website. 
uh, we started brainstorming we will be bringing something back uh, to the school committee's review next month uh, but it was about you know some of the changes that we want to see at the school website and knowing the constraints that we have uh, we don't have a dedicated webmaster but Ashok was still willing to work with what what he has at the moment so like I said I think Ashok uh, will bring it back uh, next month nothing and and uh, we had a legislative breakfast yes uh, that Jean also participated in yeah, with great. Anne and Dr. Kavanaugh uh, she was introduced there uh, as the superintendent to be uh, it was a, it was sponsored by tech um, that was uh, very exciting to be with all the legislators and some of the superintendents uh, some of the issues that came up and that that was a great forum like how you talked about earlier jean uh, voicing about the need for the circuit breaker um, to be stronger and so i think that was a great experience for me uh, personally uh, um, but just to be able to get that opportunity to be with everyone. That's yeah. great. We got to meet the new mayor of Framingham. That was very that, inspiring. That's right. That was, that was really that was exciting to listen to her speak to. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything, John? Nope. nope. So I actually do. I had uh, the opportunity to have a conversation with some uh, CPAC leadership, and they had some uh, concerns and questions they wanted to share regarding the director of student services contract and questions. Uh, and I, what I as the process goes that goes through the superintendent and I think that what I would like to do when we get to that agenda item is to request that we postpone the discussion of that and the vote on that until March 1st to allow that feedback to make its way through the superintendent's office I don't know if that's procedurally um, how we wait to that but that would be my recommendation because I know you have not had an opportunity to hear that no, so I, I have not heard anything any from any parent yeah. um, directly about concerns about Dr. Zaleski for the past three years, actually. All right, well, so I, well, yeah, it's, I, it's about the contract I, and the extension of the document. I understand, so, yeah. but I think, yes, d um, thank you for directing it to where it needs to be. Um, and I would look to Jean to make that recommendation, but I certainly would be willing to consider. Yeah, all right, that. well, why don't we, we can talk about that when we get to that agenda item, but I think that okay. that's a good suggestion or a good um, yep. strategy approach. Um, so I have a couple of liaison reports. We um, just ongoing um, work is happening on the turf fields. The bids should be coming in, I think tomorrow is the bid on the, um, what's the name of the separate bid that we're doing um, with the turf? Yeah, the NJ the, the public public the, bid part, right. and then the well, I mean they're all public bids, but the ones that we go through are cool. through the collaborative. Co collaborative. Uh, the uh, infill. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and then the other bid, I believe, comes in on February twenty first. So the subcommittee has a meeting scheduled. I'm going to say on the. 27th but it'll be posted so we will review the bids and then with the expectation that we will um, they ha has to be a process of reference checking so I think that we it'll be on our March 15th agenda most likely that we will need to accept the bids um, so this is all you know part of our ongoing work towards towards um, presenting this at town meeting in the spring and so at that point we'll be able to have firm numbers and be able to work with the town around tax impact and all of that so it's very exciting um, there's been a lot of work happening additionally to secure some private funding to help soften the um, the tax impact to uh, to the town so um, all of those things are moving forward which is great um, and then the other liaison well I'm not really a liaison necessarily but Dr. McLeod and I are liaisons now to the farewell to the center school. Um, and just really quick, to, we've had a couple of meetings which have been great, and I, this isn't a firm <laughs> decision, but we're actually leaning towards having the farewell to the center school on the day of Poly Arts in mm -hmm. September. So because it's also Hopkinton um, Family Day or Hopkinton Day, whatever they're calling it, so we feel like so many people who um, grew up here are traveling back anyway on that day and the school will be empty so people can really explore the school and you know go through every nook and cranny if they want to we'd love to have them write a farewell message on the blackboard we thought that would be a great photo um, collection so um, pencil it in for now not in pen but that's the direction that we're going and I think that that will be a really nice um, celebration and
you know, the, the building has served the town really well for 90 years, mm. so I think it is deserving of a send-off or a, a farewell. Um, and then the final liaison report that I have is just in terms of the ongoing work um, with advisory budget and the budget um, work that we're doing with the town, and I think it probably works best to have that conversation in the context of the projections that we're going to look at under new business, so I won't really go into great detail right now other than to say, you know, as we've said at the last several joint meetings, we tonight will have a further discussion of our operating budget as well as taking another look at our capital expenditures and seeing if there's anything that we can do to alleviate the, um, the tax impact that's projected for next year. So... I think that's all that every that I had. I Can I? You just reminded me that I, in my gloss over, I missed a very important line item, which is mm -hmm. the tentative planning the date for the um, the ribbon cutting, which is June 9th. So um, it's not set in stone yet, but that's the date they threw out there tentatively. So that just great. reminded me. Thank you. All right, important. penciled that one in too. Very good. Okay. Any other thoughts before we move on? Okay, so the um, under new business we have the new we have the Business Professionals of America Club overnight travel request, Dr. McLeod. Yes, thank you. This is a final approval, something that you have um, seen the initial approval that comes back to school committee because it does involve overnight travel. Um, but this one is very nearby, taking place at in Framingham. Um, it is something that they participated in last year. Um, which is why Mr. Scott is not here tonight, although he was very happy to be. Um, it, it's, nothing, it's nothing that is a new uh, thing that they're participating in. And um, they will be, it happens over a weekend, um, but it does include the return on a Monday. The improvements that we've made to the process to include, you know, reaching out to other teachers uh, have been followed. Um, and I think, and I am delighted to recommend um, your approval, final approval, on this um, on this competition. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have questions? No, it sounds great. Okay, so I'm just looking for a motion to approve the BPA overnight travel request taking place from Saturday, March 3rd, 2018, through Monday, March 5th, 2018. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay, so that's a motion by Mina, a second by John. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, so that's unanimous. Um, huh, the next one um, is a tough one. So we just do it quickly. Are considering a request by this? Well, it's probably not a surprise to anybody that the superintendent is requesting that we accept her letter, letter of retirement. Um, since we've already gone through the process of hiring a replacement, I feel that it's probably in our best interest to accept her letter. Um, and so the letter has been included in your packet, and we did accept this letter in executive session at our last meeting, at the end of the meeting. So, um, But as is required, we also need to accept the, the letter in, and the request in our public meeting. What happens if we don't? I know. It'd be really expensive. <laughs> 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 the budget will be going in the wrong direction. Yeah. yeah. Do you if I may just quickly? I, I, we commented earlier that we all overlooked the idea that we needed to actually get Dr. McLeod's retirement letter, and I actually refused to believe that that was a fully <laughs> conscious, con conscious <laughs> overlook. I think there's something in, in there that none of us actually wanted to see that come in, but um, it, not so, remotely the last time that I'll say this in public, but I'm couldn't be happier for you in, in your retirement, your opportunity to spend more time with family. Um, but this is quite frankly the vote I never wanted to take. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Um, it's been an absolute honor to be on the school committee for the tenure of you as superintendent. And um, I can't imagine, I'm actually really, really glad, no offense, that I'm <laughs> done now too, because it, mm -hmm. uh, it would be a tough transition for anybody. Um, you have been, a, a, immense value to this district and I hope you feel as professionally fulfilled as the community feels to have had you for five years. Thank you. I don't really know how to top that and I'm pretty wordy. Done. That's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so I just good. need a motion to accept the notice of retirement from the superintendent. So moved. <laughs> John said no, he Nobody won't. Wants I know. And I'm a like second. I'm still not sure how I'm voting. <laughs> All right, someone has to second it. I'll second it. Okay, um, so that's a motion by Mina and second by Nancy. Um, all in favor? Yes. 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 Fine. Anybody <laughs> opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous and you're off the hook. Okay, okay. perfect. Um, 
so additionally until the party she's off the hook uh -huh. well right well, we have so many parties good distance now that that's be right fine. Yeah, um, and tremendous respect to the person coming up that's yes. right. to, to fulfill this role yes hands. exactly um so i know i'm sorry i'm sorry. <laughs> skipping ahead. sorry sorry additionally um the, so we also reviewed in our executive session at our last meeting, at the end of the meeting, a request by Dr. McLeod for a medical leave, which would begin on March 5th um, and extend through the end of her contract, which is through June 30th. And so um, the way that this would work is actually that she is still going to be working, um, but just in a reduced role, both in terms of being a mentor to Dr. Kavanaugh, which is a tremendous opportunity for all involved, as well as um, continuing to manage certain projects, which will clearly identify before the end of February, but including budget and contract negotiations and things like that. So safety. So safety. So <laughs> we just right, added exactly. that one. Safety. <laughs> so um, so and we'll and we'll we'll have a definitive list before the end of February. But so um, so we do need to agree to her request for a medical leave. But I just want to be clear that she still will be. Um, consulting and working on certain projects with the district so she's not really shed of us yet um, but uh, I do the letter was in your packet and again we've reviewed it in executive session so I do need unfortunately a motion to approve the superintendent's request for a medical leave so moved in a second second um, okay all in favor yes, yes. okay um, and so I, all I can say is uh, you know we wish you well, and we know that you, uh, we, you. We hope that you put as much energy into the leave as you do into your regular job. So, okay. um, and we we thank you for you leaving us in such tremendous hands with Dr. Cavanaugh. So the second piece of of this um, situation, I guess. Yeah, maybe the third is uh, right. <laughs> You're right. right. Is um, that we also need to appoint an acting superintendent because Dr. McLeod won't be full-time in the district. So fortunately for us, we have an inc incoming superintendent who is willing to do a job and a half slash two jo job and three quarters, whatever it ends up to be, um, for the period of March 5th through June, 20, June 30th, 2018. And then she will begin her full-time role as a superintendent in July. So we have, um, we have to review, I mean, excuse me, we have to vote to appoint Dr. Kavanaugh as the acting superintendent. We did review the, um, the addendum to her contract in executive session, so we'll need to approve that and just authorize the chair to sign that. So um, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, no. so I just need a motion to appoint Dr. Kavanaugh as the acting superintendent. So I'll make the motion, but I also would be remiss. I'm talking a lot tonight. Yeah. We didn't publicly, thank you for your willingness to step up. As Mrs. Birchman said, I mean, one and a, I think you already have one and a half jobs, so this is is adding more on top of that. So it's a it's a great service to the community, and, and we really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay. Um, and all in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So that is our motion to appoint. I also need a motion to approve addendum A, acting superintendent appointment to Dr. Kavanaugh's contract of employment. Um, so moved. Okay, so I'm gonna give that one to Nancy in a second. Mina. To Mina. Yes. Um, all in favor? Yes. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, and then um, that was to approve the contract and then I just need a motion to authorize the chair to sign on behalf of the committee. So moved. Um, okay, in a second. I'll second that one. Thanks. It was your turn. Was your turn. Was your turn. It's fine. Was, hey, I felt like we didn't jump. Yes. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. So thank you very much. And Dr. Kavanaugh, I will do that with you before we leave tonight. So oh, we can you. give that to our HR director. Um, okay, so our, the next item on our agenda is um, the Director of Student Services contract, and so this is the one, um, Nancy, that you were requesting that we consider just postponing until our March 1st um, meeting. I, I know, as I said, as I was walking into the meeting, I did receive um, an email that I haven't had a chance to really read, and, and I will certainly forward it to Dr. 
McLeod. So I think if you all are comfortable with the suggestion that we postpone this until March 1st, that will give people the opportunity to share their feedback with Dr. McLeod for her consideration, and we'll bring um, a recommendation back at that time. So is that okay with you? Um, the only, if I may yes. just add that um, I, I think it would be fitting to not only bring a recommendation but also a report that I would clearly clear with Dr. Cap, Dr. Zaleski, um, and Dr. Kavanaugh um, around her performance, which is not something typically done. Um, but I think, given that I've been asked to do this and consider um, some additional information, I think the school committee also um, should get a full picture in terms of the, the contributions that Dr. Zaleski has made to the district and that have gone into my recommendation around her contract. And so if that's okay, mm -hmm. um, it would be more in the form of a report and a recommendation. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. so, and just to be clear, so this is one of the contracts that, although we do approve the contract, it's at the recommendation of the superintendent and this is not a person that we evaluate directly. That's only the superintendent that has that pleasure. Um, so, okay, so we will postpone that one. Our next item is our budget projections. However, I know Mr. Manning is planning to come. Okay. Um, so we only have one <clears throat> item under old business. If it's okay with you, why don't we take that item? And sure. um, we're still like a half an hour ahead. So mm -hmm. I don't know. God, I don't want to take a half an hour to talk about the final travel approval, yeah. but um, but we can at least give them a few extra minutes. So if that's okay, we'll jump ahead, um, Dr. McLeod, to old business. A. And unfortunately, I cannot drag this out okay. at all, Gene, <laughs> no, because kind of like it's your final seconds. approval stamp, kind yeah. of. Um, these are both international trips. As you know, um, the international travel proposals for next year were brought up for your consideration um, a, a couple of meetings ago. Um, this one went through that, these two trips went through that process a year ago which then allows the organizers to find out if there's interest for the trip, to gather more information. Um, and now on the eve of, of the trips, the first is taking place, well, they're both April vacation? They're both April vacation um, of this mm -hmm. current year. Um, one to Iceland and one to Scotland and England. We can, I would mm -hmm. recommend that you take them up separately for consideration, um, but certainly um, I think if we, as we have discussed, in the past, these opportunities for students are wonderful. Um, over the past several years, the school committee has really um, considered their role as it relates to the trips and the fact that parents are very much involved with making decisions as they should be in terms of their child's participation. Um, but it is your um, one of your responsibilities to approve an international travel. Um, these are both being led by well-known, uh, both both EF tours we've had excellent experience with and both with great leaders from within our schools. So if you want to take them up separately. Sure, yep. Does anybody have questions on the Scotland and England trip? Nope. Sounds amazing. Sounds yes. like a dream. I know. I know. In my next great. life, I want to be the chaperone of these trips, I think. A month and a half. Great opportunities. <laughs> They're going. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> um, all right. So I am looking for a motion to approve the internet, to improve the, for the final, excuse me, for final approval of the international trip to Scotland and England for April 14 through 22nd, 2018. So moved. And a second. second. Okay, so motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Graziano. All, f all in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, any opposed? No. Um, and so I also am looking for a motion to for the final approval of the international travel trip to Iceland for April 15th through April 20th, 2018. So moved. And a second. I'll second it. Okay, so a motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Anybody opposed? All right, so that's unanimous. We gave him three minutes. <laughs> I don't know what else we to do. We did what we could. We did what we could. We'll catch him up when he gets here. Um, so why don't I turn it over to you, Dr. McLeod, and we can go through the – so just as a – should I give a little context about what we're doing and why? Please. So we have had a series of um, 
this will kill some time. <laughs> we've, had, <laughs> we've had a series of meetings with the Board of Selectmen, joint meetings with the Board of Selectmen and the Appropriations Committee, as well as all the department heads on the town side of government um, regarding the, the budget um, and the concern for the overall tax impact for next year. And um, so uh, through those meetings, several requests have been made um, to all of departments and all of the departments in terms of going back and looking for further reductions um, to try to lessen the tax impact. Um, and in addition, they have the the request was made to do some forecasting so that an analysis could be made of whether or not this is sort of a one year belt tightening or you know biting of a bullet. I guess that's not a very good um, metaphor to use today. Or if this is the beginning of a concerning trend um, that the town isn't going to be able to um, sustain. And so you know the conversation at this point is really um, an analysis of balancing fixed costs and determining whether or not the, pay the required payment of fixed costs is going to re result in a reduction in services across all town departments or an increase in taxes. And I think very simply that's the decision that's in front of the Board of Selectmen right now. So as part of that, we have been asked to do some projecting for the next couple of years just to get an idea of what our budgets can be expected to look like. Um, so that's as long of an intro as I can <laughs> muster. So I'll turn it over okay. to you. Thank you. And um, just add in to, in addition to budget project projections, Jean and I had discussed as it relates to the agenda um, that we will also yep. bring back for consideration as part of this report um, discussion around capital and um, preparation for the next meeting, that joint meeting that we have scheduled for the 26th. Um, I would like to acknowledge the tremendous work of Sue Rothermick as it relates to this ongoing discussion. I think, you know, not only your um, willingness to continue to provide us with the information, but in this regard, this came, was, was quite unexpected. Um, it's a great process, it's great information, but it was not something that we were operating under um, as far as the budget message came. And so she has very quickly, um, and I can't pretend to understand all that was involved, um, but I do know that you put a tremendous amount of time into it, and I just want to thank you for that, Sue. Thank you. Um, and with that, um, there's no better person to take you through these next few slides than, than Sue. So why don't, um, why don't I turn it over to you? Sure, well, thank you. Um, and it was a good introduction, uh, Jean, for what you're saying. And basically, when we've uh, presented the FY19 budget, we have pointed out how we've had certain things that were fixed, um, such as contracts and um, some changes in special education that were beyond our control, and also, to a degree, you know, a correction. So the bus contract is a market correction. Um, so those are, the, those are the challenges that we had for FY19. So looking forward, what are our challenges going forward? So the first thing that we would start with are the, uh, the projections. And it, you know, as we do to put together the budget, we look at the enrollment projections and um, you know, what is happening with, the, with student growth. And as you know, through the past number of years, Hopkinton continues to grow. Um, many districts across the state, that is not the case. So Hopkinton does continue to grow, and so that will continue to become a stress on, on the budget. So when you look at the projection for FY20, it's an increase of 50 students. Wasn't that funny how it came out on there? Projected, got <coughs> truncated, sorry about that. FY29 is an increase of 29 students. And FY22 actually shows a little drop but if you go out to FY23, it goes back into the positive again is, and is up another 20 students. And if you look at the NESDEC projections over 10 years, it's actually an increase of 212 students. So it, it's a trend that will continue. Um, and as a result, the schools and all town departments will be making adjustments accordingly. Before you move on, Sue, if I might just add, um that as you know, these are the NESDEC numbers that we were 
from this past November, um, and they always reset. So these are the projected numbers going out. They will be resetting their projections based on our actuals, but not until next fall. Mm -hmm. The question that was asked of us at the last meeting, um, I think, believe it came from Claire, was whether or not this continued growth, even without a reset, which we have found we needed, do we have evidence that it's going to continue? So even from a, from a really high perspective looking down, there, there is sufficient evidence. And when Sue did this work, it really is looking at it globally, K-12, because as you know, when we have the ins and outs of, it's not as simple as saying, okay, we're gonna need two more at the elementary level. This is a district-wide look, um, because you know that we would have associated reductions as well um, to take care of, for example, what looks like a projected change or reduction we're not seeing that across the board. We're certainly not seeing it at the elementary level. And so those changes happen. This is really looking at it really globally, K-12 over time, to give um, this idea that yes, we have evidence, and the evidence that's in front of us every day with ongoing en uh, enrollments um, and registrations, um, that we will be con continuing to grow uh, for the foreseeable future. And Thank Ms. you. Mr. just one question on the slide. So the FY19, the change, uh, would you happen to remember what that is? That's from, 18 from 18 to 19? Yes. Mm. <coughs> uh, 12. But that That number, was projected. Sorry. Right. Yes. I was going to say, that yeah. number is projected, not actual. Because right. then we've had... Yeah a series of administrators in here saying that, well and we had on our slide yep. on our last budget presentation we've had 60 new students this year right or something like that that was and as of October uh, since October so yes yes and I think probably there are probably more since that slide was yes. developed yes um, so, so just so I understand that clearly so the plus 12 is on the projected of last year and, but the actual has been higher. Yes. Like 5x higher. Right. It mm -hmm. sounds like. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where I say we'll reset. NESDEG will reset their numbers based on our actuals. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if nothing else, this gives us a baseline of continued growth that we know is, we have every reason to expect that it will be even greater than the, the 212 number that is currently showing over the next 10 years. It, it just so you understand the process, so every October 1, we, we do our, our count that goes to the state, and that those are the numbers that NESDEC takes as being our actuals. So they took our October 1 numbers for 2017, and that's, where, that's what Dr. McLeod is talking about as the reset, and they will come and take the numbers from October 1, 2018, and reset the full projections. So that's the consistent date that we use is our October 1 report that we submit to the state. Okay. And Thank according you. to our data on January 1st, we had 3,478 students. So it's more than what they predicted for FY19. Well, So just looking at the assumptions, so again, this is you know district-wide, 40,000-foot level. Um, mm -hmm. So the enrollment change of 50 students, looking at that from an FTE standpoint, using the assumption of one staff for every 20 students, you're looking at 2.5 FTEs. The other piece that comes into play is a bus. With an additional 50 students, you would be looking at also adding a bus. Now in FY19, keep in mind, we also added a bus. So FY18 to 19, we added a bus that was also part of that increase in our bus contract. <coughs> um, the L staff, we're looking at an additional FTE, and um, Dr. Kavanaugh could speak to that, I'm sure. And again, just with the changing in, in demographics, the assumption is that you may be also looking at an additional special education FTE. That's for FY20. And then out of district tuition, the assumption um, is as we go further is we take the, um, the tuition pricing at 3% and just assume that we would have one new placement. 
So you can see what the assumptions are for 21 and 22 using all of those same uh, ratios. The new one would be out in FY22 is a maintenance FTE. We did actually put in originally an additional maintenance FTE for FY19. Um, the amount of square footage that we were bringing on and knowing that, not that we were not keeping up center school, but we were doing less knowing that a building was replacing it. As we start to get into full-fledged preventive maintenance schedules across the district, I think in time you will see the, the need for that additional maintenance person to keep the buildings to where the standard that we would need. Can we ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity for reference, we assume one new out-of-district placement per year. For example, this year, do have we had more than one, or has it been one? This year we had several. Right. So even though we assume one, and that's a significant price tag associated with putting it a student can in be. a placement. It can. It, it all depends. Um, so if a student moves into the district and they have an existing IEP, right. it's, a, it's a stay put until um, we get to know the student, review, you know, et cetera. They could be at a collaborative, which could be less expensive. They could be at a very expensive private placement. So we really don't know. So, but it's wise to build in at least an assumption right. of one. And you're right, this year we had more than one. Right, yeah. okay, just throwing that out there. Yeah. Um, so this one is a little bit more difficult to see from the, from the distance, but basically what we did, taking those assumptions, this is just your salary projection. So starting with the beginning. Sorry, so do you have copies? Are there copies? I do, so I. Yep. Shared this with everyone, but I, you know, I, I do have hard on my copies. Printer at yep, home. Just, sorry. just in case. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I made them. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. You, nope. Yep. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't know that. The far away, I can see it's the up close. I have a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Then. So. Well, and it begins to get small. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. So. To, to come up with the salary projection, the payroll projection, we start with the prior year uh, salary, come up with an estimate for step lane and colas across all of your bargaining units and um, for staff that are not unaffiliated with a, a collective bargaining. This, these are the FTEs, the NESDEC enrollment increase. Now keep in mind for FY19, we did a tremendous amount of cutting of staff as we were you know, reorganizing, knowing that we were putting staff in place. So you can see what the net impact um, increase was. <coughs> the L teachers that were part of the budget and then coming down to FY22, you'll see where we put in the, the maintenance FTE as well. So you can see from a salary perspective, the FY19 increase for salary is 4.4. FY20, 4.5, FY21, 4.3, and FY22 is 3.6. So it starts to drop off a little in 22 if we do not continue the trend of having to add an L and, and a special education teacher. From an expense perspective, again, the projection, taking prior year, adding in that special education, the 3% tuition, and one additional. The busing contract, you can see that was a, a big reset for FY19 um, that we had to take in place. FY20, that's the contractual increase, plus an additional bus. And then you start to see in 21 and 22, if we're not adding a bus, the, the change in that contract is, is much easier to fit within the confines of the budget. Building and grounds, again, the other piece for FY19 is bringing on the new building. So the increase in utilities for Marathon, again, for 30,000 additional square feet, um, that's coming from the engineering that was part of the estimate of bringing on the new building. Then in FY20, we will be negotiating a, or going out to bid for a new gas contract. And then the other piece that we will start to have to put in place, we do not have any extraordinary maintenance in the FY19 budget for the Elmwood School. Knowing that we have an SOI out there, 
However, that still takes years to, to come into play. So I think you will want to start building in that Elmwood um, extraordinary maintenance over time. FY21 will be putting out, will be up for a new electric contract. And that's anywhere between a five and 8% increase potential. And then FY22, again, putting in a little bit more. So kind of easing into that extraordinary maintenance that will be needed going forward in the future. Occupational day, if you look at the trend, uh, we have added a student almost every year. So that budget does continue to grow. So that is adding one additional student a year. And then just looking at an inflation rate at this point, just using a 1.3%. A so you can see what's happened with our expenses. In FY20, they're still substantial. It's a 5.6% increase. But then when you get out to FY22, it's actually less than a 1%. And that becomes a function of just changes in, in special education. Now, assuming that we don't have tremendous changes in the other direction, you know, everything does come with ebbs and flows. And so FY22, we start to benefit. And so we can see how that, that plays out as, as students age out of the system. So looking at those for our budget projections, FY19, as we've been discussing, is an increase of 6.9%. And again, we'll talk about those specific drivers. But then when you look at FY20, it, we're looking at a projection of 4.7% increase. FY21, a 4.2% increase. And then FY22 is where we start to see a little bit of a break if things continue to play in our favor at 3%. Any questions on any of the assumptions that we've used so far? This is great so far. So just a reminder, um, when you look at per pupil expenditures um, and using the DESI, what is on the DESI website, the most current uh, per pupil expenditures is still 2016 right now. So you can see where the state average is at 15,544. And you can see where Hopkinton falls, which is below the state average. And I'll let uh, Dr. McLeod yeah. speak to this slide. Right. And so, you know, looking at the both per pupil and combining it with our ranking, this was a slide basically that we shared at town meeting last year. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting for me to think back to that meeting and then to be at the table talking about what we're talking about tonight is that overall people were applauding. You know, the, the school department, um, as we will recall, there were no questions asked of our budget only mm -hmm. that short time ago. And what I like to remind people of is that the, the discussions and the challenges that we have with the budget and then the discussions about our performance are not connected um, unless we make a point of connecting them. They come out at different times of the year. We are very proud of our performance and we start talking about it, but I am extremely fearful um, that if we start to reduce our services or, or um, consider doing things differently, I guess what I want to reinforce is that we are where we are and we continue to be where we are because of thoughtful planning, because of adjusting our programs throughout. As you know, we are always first looking at what we can stop doing when something changes. The attention to detail around the data you hear consistently coming to you, Dr. Kavanaugh has, pr has provided those those reports over the past couple of years, that is the way in which we work. And what troubles me greatly, and I think we need to make very clear, is that if we are being asked to do things differently, if we're being asked to reduce um, the, um, further, it will come at a cost. And it might not show up right away, um, but it will begin to show up. Um, 
because all of the recommendations, as you know, because you've sat through hours and hours of these conversations, have come about because of needs that we have identified within each of our schools. Um, and so it's important for us to remember, you know, and maybe three isn't the goal, and that is our high school. But we are equally proud of our third graders. We are just as proud of our third graders as we are of our, th of our high school ranking. We just learned that once again, our high school ha is received a ranking of, of one. Um, and that's a whole different ranking system. Um, but in terms of gap bridging measures and their ongoing performance and the, the things that they've been doing, that is purposeful. Those, those things happen because we've been planning around it and we have mm -hmm. staff in place and programs in place to meet the needs of kids that are identified. Um, and we're incredibly proud and we've had fabulous support from our school committee and from our community. Um, I just want it to be very clear that if we do need to take another look at the operating budget, this is something um, that would have to include our entire team sitting down together, really pulling apart the budget, all of the many layers of it, um, because there was an example that came up and it wasn't, it wasn't class size at the kindergarten level, but there was another one. Oh, I know what it was. For example, there was a question about the math tutor at the Hopkins School. And what I continue to want to reinforce, and you know this, is that those recommendations were done as part of a process. And that principal, in this case, Ms. Bellello, made other choices. One of her choices was to maintain the numbers of teachers, to purposely go into larger class size because she knew curriculum challenges that she was gonna be faced with, particularly around math, that she felt very strongly, and it was supported by our administrative discussions and Dr. Kavanaugh's leadership with curriculum, that this was a real priority. So although it feels like it's low-hanging fruit, it's not. It's part of a, a very detailed consideration of the overall needs within her building. And so I know we are gonna talk about capital, but we really need to understand how this discussion ends up affecting performance ultimately um, and, and where we are as we compare ourselves to other surrounding districts as it relates to per pupil. Um, and now our, that our numbers are increasing, the needs are, the, the, the numbers of kids we're servicing are increasing too. So I'm not saying anything that we haven't heard at the table, but I did feel that it was an important to connect those dots and um, just summarize that perspective. <clears throat> the rest of it is really here for us to refer back to. None of it is new, um, but as we, um, I, I don't know, Jean, if you want to first discuss this part of the projections and then go to capital. Yeah. Okay. And I, I so I will just welcome oh, Mr. Manning, who <laughs> made, yeah, we were so far ahead of schedule. We did everything else, I'm sorry, but we did start a little bit early. So I think Jen gave you a copy of what we just walked through in terms yes, of. Yes, in terms of the projections, so I know you're a math wizard and you can quickly get up to speed on those and, um, you know, and I can follow up with you later if you have questions about that. But um, I don't know if you want to join us. We're going to now go through, you know, you've been at the joint meetings with us, so we're going to now go through, um, you know, just the ongoing conversation about the FY19 budget and the capital um, items. And so I guess... Okay, so let's start, let's first see if there are questions on the yeah. projections and then I'll give sort of a recap of where we are and then we'll go into the FY19 or what the request Capital. has been yep. from the Board of Selectmen. So that seems like the smartest yep. way to do it. Okay, Sounds so um, does anybody have questions about the, the forecasting that we just did? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have, uh, you look like Jane, do you have no, a question? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. So first, I'm super excited to see this. You know, projection out looks like a lot of thought has gone in. You know, you've added all of this detail, um, you know, looked at the projections, you know, the growth, and um, some of these details around the buildings and grounds. I would think a lot of thought has gone in. So it's helpful to see that detail. So um, great job on that front. 
uh, both to you and, and the rest of the folks who worked on putting this together. So I have, I have two questions for you. One is on the inflation, mm -hmm. the 1.3%. Can you speak to, you know, what's the basis for that? I, I mean, it's, it is to a degree um, somewhat random, but, you know, if you look at some of the inflation rate over the past couple of years, it's, it's been, you know, fairly low. Okay, okay, um, okay. And the other question, uh, what was my other question? Oh, I'm having one of those moments. So, so we can come back to you if you think that, that sounds that okay. That sounds good. All right, John, did you have questions? Um, so first of all, this is tremendous work. Thank you for doing this. I know this isn't easy, but the, the, the level of detail in the assumptions is, I think is extremely important for not as much this audience, but other audiences that we'll be meeting with to, to show that there is some real um, meat behind these numbers. No, I, I don't have a question. I, I do think it, what, what's important, and what my first takeaway that's important here is that that's the, the illustrative piece on, on slide five is that is that the 6.9% increase that we're seeing this year, that we're proposing this year, is not a run rate for us. Right. The world hasn't suddenly changed permanently. 4.7 and 4.2 feel a lot more consistent with increases that we have had over the past few years. Right. So the message that we have been putting out there that this is unusual because of, of a few significant budget drivers that we don't think are going to necessarily recur, at least in their growth. Um, this does an excellent job of, of illustrating that, which I think based on the meeting we had earlier today uh, is going to be a, a very important part of the discussion. Yeah. So thank you. I remembered my other question, okay. if I may. Um, so I was just wondering if projections of this nature were done in the past, and could this be a living document going forward? I mean, clearly, you, we don't know what will happen in 2022, right? I mean, even with this year, we know how much, how many changes have happened, and the fact that we talked about, you know, if we have uh, kids with out of district placement or or a more. Um, ELL population, if you will, that's going to change a lot here. So I'm just wondering if there is any way to institutionalize this document in some shape or form. And you know, as things change, we have some kind of tracking to say, we did think that this would be, you know, and for FI20, it was, we were thinking at this day, 4.7, but here are some of the changes that have happened. That's the reason why, because I would absolutely expect these numbers to fluctuate. Mm -hmm. this it, is your absolutely. Best, so, right? you know, uh, a projection is a projection at a, yeah. at a point in time. Right. A budget that we develop in, in the fall is a budget based on assumptions at a point in time. So everything does evolve and change as you get closer to, you know, the, the opening day of school, if you will. Right. So it does need to be adjusted and it does need to be a, a living document so that each time you do a new budget, you're extending out your new budget projections. Right. Absolutely. So, so you do think that we could keep this as a living document going forward? Absolutely. That uh, would be great. I would say from my experience with budgeting in, in this town overall, and Mr. Manning could probably back me up here, I think it would be good to keep this a living document yeah. because this document right here is an artifact. So yeah. when we start talking about the FY20, right. if mm -hmm. we come in with a five, then it's going to be the question of, I thought we were projecting at 4.7, what happened? So I think we, it's mm -hmm. going to be important to have that progression for people who are not as close to the budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I may, I do agree with that, uh, what uh, Mr. Graziano was saying, in that you know the town does this, you know we, when we do our sheets, do, the town is doing modeling too, trying to go out five years. We know what our debt is. We know what a lot of things is. But we also do put assumptions in for the school costs. And we're telling you the numbers that we think it is, and this gives you the opportunity to say, this is our own modeling, mm -hmm. and this is where we're at. So there is benefit to you having your own model, too, instead of the town telling you, the town side uh, uh, financial plan to tell this is what we want you to be at. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I well, I'm going to just basically repeat a lot of what Mr. Graziano said, so I'll be brief, or brief about it. But I, I thought I took the same thing away from it that you did, which is as we have been 
experiencing or believing that this year is unusual and sort of a perfect storm in many ways. And, you know, the numbers are still higher, I think, than the appropriations and selectmen are really excited about, but they are going back to the levels that are more consistent with where we have been over the last couple of years, which, again, are really driven by the increasing diversity of our student population as well as the increasing number of our students. But, um, but I think that, you know, <laughs> We asked you to do this a week ago, if you could, and I think that the amount of time and effort, but also the quality of the detail that went into it is really tremendous. Yeah. So you kind of set a high bar for yourself. But <laughs> um, but I do agree. We, I mean, you know, it's a conversation that some of us have been part of for many, many years about doing a better job of exactly this. And so um, I think that this is an excellent place to start and you're right John now it's out there so you really it's to our benefit to update it otherwise somebody else is gonna either update it for us or hold us to it if something has changed so um, so I think that that's great and I think my, my closing remark would just be that when we go to the um, joint meeting on the 26th I would really hope that there's time on the agenda for for you to be able to lead everybody through this because I think that it will really help to um, improve everybody's understanding of, of what's happening on our side of the budget. And we do own, you know, slightly north of 50% of the budget in the town. So um, we can follow up with, with Mr. Kamalo, but I would love to see everybody be able to walk through this mm -hmm. um, presentation on Monday. And I know that they're working on something similar from the town side as well. Um, so all that. Any other questions? Yeah, this or? is great. Okay. Are you, any other thoughts? Okay. So I think what makes sense now, you know, we can. I know the next slides about the budget and the um, and the capital. And so just as a recap, sort of where we are, we've had a series of joint meetings, and you know there have been several requests made that that in some ways. Not, don't contradict each other, but are hard to blend together. Um, you know, and I think that my takeaway from the last joint meeting was that there were several requests and several open questions. One open question is the issue that the town is um, working to get greater detail on regarding the actual um, health care increases and they hope to have that number in a couple of weeks as I understand it which could make a significant difference in what we're looking at in terms of a budget increase the other is that the um, combination of the debt service on the new projects plus existing service on old projects on top of the operating increases that not only the schools are facing but as I heard it around the table, every town department is feeling pressure of um, the number of people and the increasing demands that that's um, placing on all of the services in town. And so I can, I, I, you hear the selectmen sort of wrestling with um, a delicate balance between, you know, paying the bill that's coming due for capital investments, but wanting to keep the lights on and provide the services that people require and have come to expect. So um, they have asked all town departments to go back and take a further look at making some reductions. Um, they did acknowledge that we have already reduced about $200,000 out of our original budget request. I think they're still carrying the 7.3 number. Um, so they asked us to look for an additional four hundred thousand um, dollars but they also or at least some of them said that they didn't want to see a reduction in staff and so that's the part where we're struggling a little bit because we really have already reduced so much in this budget and as you've said several times um, Dr. McLeod and um, Ms. Rothermick this really in many ways is a fixed cost budget even though it's a seven percent increase yeah. almost <coughs> so um, so I think you know, when we had a, a meeting, we had the opportunity to have a meeting with the town manager this afternoon. And I, th I think my suggestion is going to be the following. We'll go through, um, you know, I don't believe that there have been any changes that have come to light that you would recommend right now in terms of the operating budget. No. We can go through the capital 
and see if there's anything, particularly in the pay-as-you-go category, that we could postpone. Um, and although that wouldn't reduce the school district's operating budget, it's possible that that could alleviate some of the stress either in the town operating budget or reduce the debt service, right, John? Um, so could help still help the bottom line, even though it didn't necessarily directly reduce our budget. Um, and then, you know, obviously this is something that we can all talk about, but my recommendation is that anything, after we go through the capital, whatever is the difference between what we come up with and the $400,000, is that we give you time next week to have a conversation, because that's not a, you know, an off the cuff, let's pick a couple of things mm -hmm. here, to have a, you know, to give a pre-K to 12 look at how, what, what, what if, if that's where we are and we're and, and everyone's going to be instructed that it's necessary this year to reduce, reduce services what is that going to mean to the school district I, I don't and then and if that is where we are at the joint meeting on Monday then we can have that conversation at that time and mm -hmm. you can if that's enough time you can make that okay. um, presentation to us I guess in the context of the joint meeting but I don't want to start throwing things out there right now I think it really creates panic in the community and, and with the staff and until we know for sure that that is the directive of the Board of Selectmen to all town departments, mm -hmm. I'm hesitant to to create that panic mm -hmm. and I don't think that we have enough information, you, you haven't had the time to make that mm -hmm. evaluation. So that okay. was that's a really long winded starting point. Um, so. That said, I guess we can skip right ahead to the capital projects, which you conveniently put up there for us. Um, does it help to go through just one by one? Or you want? Let, let's start with the page you go. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one that I see that's pay as you go is the dishwasher for the cafeteria. Um, so if we were to postpone that. Would that add cost in terms of adding back in the cost of the um, disposable trays or? No, so this was, um, so that would not increase costs. Okay. You know, so unlike some of these other um, capital projects, uh, this was to replace a dishwasher that was pulled out years ago. So nothing mm -hmm. would change it would not affect operation okay. by postponing that decision. Okay. Why don't we get, how about if we get clarity on, in that okay. regard on all of them and then we'll go back and talk about the whole package. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, the campus road master it's plan study, okay. that is a bond, right? Yeah. So, and that one, just as a reminder, is really necessary, A, because we are no longer parents are no longer able to queue on the roads so we need to move all of the traffic onto the campus but B provides the opportunity to pave field nine and park the buses there which brings the excise revenue to the town mm -hmm. that's correct so would that revenue come to the town in FY19 if the parking lot the way the contract is written the bus contract if the parking lot is done, then the vendor is required to register mm -hmm. and park their buses within the town of Hopkinton. Once they are registered within Hopkinton, the excise tax comes to Hopkinton. So if this goes forward and the town can calculate what the excise tax is, that is something that they could factor into their operating budget as an increase. That's correct. Uh, and sometimes the way you do this is you basically look at that excise tax as being the funding source to pay the debt service on this bond. Okay. So, you know, you can add it, add it as a cash flow or you can just, you know, so you end up in the same place. Okay. Um, but yes, this okay. would this would create revenue. Okay. Can I add mm -hmm. something to this um, conversation? So, uh, just a reminder to everybody at last year's town meeting that there were more questions as it related to traffic calming about what was going to happen with the queuing on Hayden Road than there were any other questions about the project in, in, it, in overall, right? Um, 
we had a solution that was not um, going to meet with, with the, the safety focus of that traffic calming. Um, and in, in cooperation with um, DPW and the ma town manager, we were then um, basically tasked with coming up with an alternative solution. So this is part of the alternative solution and goes hand in hand with the town's traffic calming um, project. And so it needs to be, I believe it's really important as we talk about it that we continue to connect it to that as an overall project for the town. And to be clear, this includes the money to pave the parking lot? It. This is the <coughs> money to pave the okay. parking lot. All right, because that question came up when we were at the Board of Selectmen on Tuesday night. Um, so the HVAC replacements district-wide, this is a pay-as-you-go article, and this is different than the middle school auditorium right. air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So um, the question was asked of me, which I could not confidently answer, what HVAC this covers, and I, you know, and then I'll ask you again, if we were to postpone that, is that going to necessitate an increase to our operating budget? Mm -hmm. So the HVAC di um, district-wide, basically what this article covers, we have 20 exhaust fans that are non-functioning. We have the, um, a unit in the Elmwood School or that controls the uh, gym that is non-functioning. And we have two hot water pumps in Hopkins that are non-functioning. So. District-wide, it covers a lot of um, a lot of different pieces of equipment that have been non-functioning probably for a while. Uh, the exhaust fans, basically, what that does is you have um, intake that is bringing in your fresh air to mix with your existing, but we're not now able to exhaust out the interior. So it causes a problem in terms of the balancing um, when you're both heating or, um, uh, you know, heating the building. You're not going to have areas that are working as well. Um, so what happens if we don't do this? They will, could, it, you have to do it eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so the, these are all units that will have to be done. That's not to say that 10 more exhaust fans don't add to that next year. Mm -hmm. um, so HVAC district-wide, unfortunately, is a huge area that needs to be addressed. Okay. But I think we're also talking about improving efficiency and the additional cost that comes to not repairing them. Mm -hmm. um, we know is significant just in all of our buildings where people are doing what they need to do to stay comfortable. And in many situations, um, it's reported that it's, it's an uncomfortable learning, learning environment. And so things have been happening, additional heaters brought in when necessary, windows open with the heat blaring, which is then making the, you know, the heating system work even harder. So all of those things are, are wasting, really, uh, resources by not addressing and fixing the problem. And to, just to give an example, so you have two units that control the, the gym at Elmwood. Yep. One of them is down. So the other one is going to try to make up for that other one. So it'll run harder mm -hmm. and, and longer, and that may be the next one to go down. You know, and then you have nothing. So, you know, there is a risk benefit to every decision that you make, but you know, these are the number of units at this point in time that that are down. Um, I have one question and you may have thought about this. Is there any way to stagger this? you know, do some work this year and... and well, and that, so there. that's what you're going to be discussing this evening. Mm -hmm. Okay. But also it sounds like you anticipate some similar, hopefully less, a, an article for similar types of... Um, hopefully this is something that, and, and so that's where you see that slowly increasing your extraordinary maintenance right. so that we're doing it within the budget within the budget yeah. okay um, but and it's I, not something will, that will happen overnight okay. and I, I i could be wrong and maybe one of you remember but i believe that part of this was pushed off from last year as well um the hvac work remember when we reduced capital towards the end of our 
budget deliberation, there were a few things. We did make a two hundred thousand dollar reduction. We did. So I'd have to look it up, but I do think that too. HVAC and is something that we've been pushing off. Yeah, um, I would have to go over back time. I wouldn't be confident in no. my memory at that. Okay, um, and so then the next one is the walk-in refrigerator freezers district wide. That's also in pay as you go for twenty thousand dollars. And so, um, can you remind us about this and let us know if this is something that were postponed? Would it add to our operating budget? Um, so this is something that I would not advise to postpone. Okay. Um, these are your refrigeration for your cafeterias, mm -hmm. and they are going down, um, and they they've gone down multiple times. So it, it it's something that we really need to address. Okay. Um, the air conditioning in the middle school auditorium is a bond article. It also is something that we have postponed many times. Um, you know, so if we were to postpone that because it's a bond article, you're really saving the debt service on it, uh, not the full cost, not the full two hundred thousand right. dollar borrowing. Um, is there other than people being uncomfortable at town meeting in the spring concerts? Is I mean, is there a safety issue or anything related no. to postponing that one? No. no. Okay. Um, can yeah. be a plug on that one. I'm, I'm not necessarily even suggesting I would vote for keeping it on, but it's important from context for context for those who haven't been here as long. This was actually approved at town meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, but the estimate was significantly off, so we were not able to actually complete the work, and we would need to go back to town meeting for a reappropriation of an, of a much higher amount. Um, I just raised that because contextually the, that is a question that will probably at some point come up. Hey, didn't we vote to put air conditioning in this place and it's not there. So, mm -hmm. okay. Right. Mm. Yes. Is, it, is it For the air conditioning, is that additional funds, 200000 or is that the same article over again with the additional funds? Would you know? These are the additional, additional funds, funds right. to fully fund that article. What do you have? We have 60? Eighty thousand, like eighty-five thousand, is sitting there. Still in there. Yeah. Um, any other questions on the middle school auditorium? Okay, and so then the security upgrades for the cameras, that is also a bond article. Um, is all of that related to cameras? The two hundred thousand dollars? Yeah. One of yes, it is, Jean. Okay. And again, this has been something um, that was part of a long-range security plan. Um, this has been stretched out over time um, to reduce and and be able to fund smaller amounts of the plan. Um, we do keep pushing it ahead. This one um, I want to also put a plug in for because not only are we talking about um, security within the buildings but concerns that have been raised from the public this year in particular um, about security on our at our parking lots mm -hmm. and um, some things that have been happening um, that have required additional police scrutiny but also some break-ins and um, and then um, families not f feeling that kids perhaps are not safe when it gets dark not that this buys lights but the having the cameras out there um, is certainly considered part of a security plan overall security plan <laughs> With that said, we could def we could look to do part of it and prioritize the the areas that are most. I mean, we've got perimeter types of uh, considerations uh, to our earlier discussion about full disclosure, as well as parking areas. Mm -hmm. We could prioritize, um, but then to your comment about it being a bond funded article, I don't know if that at all contributes to what we're being asked. To do right, I mean, no, so it would only be the debt service on it, right, Mike? So, and I, probably yeah, not, and probably not even. And uh, honestly, not, I mean, not next year. I don't see how we can. I, I know I said we'll talk about it all together at the end, but I mean, think uh, about how we started our meeting. I, I just don't think this <clears throat> is something that the town can. Also, operational impact. Security cameras are the kind of thing that could prevent us from having to completely redo Field Thirteen. Field Thirteen, right? exactly. I mean, like it's, right. That's operational impact because we have right. because we had no way of, of of actually assessing what happened there. Yeah, right. No, I agree. So I we'll have to talk about all of them at the end, but 
spoiler alert. I have mm. strong feelings on that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the technology upgrades is a pay-as-you-go article. So we do have a technology. Up I mean, Ashoka's been great about sort of planning out, mapping out a couple of years in advance and making that number consistent. I think, if I remember correctly, we've already reduced that number. We have. Because it usually is $200,000, mm -hmm. and it's 165 So that's in pay-as-you-go. Um, the Board of Selectmen also was interested in understanding more about what was in um, in that article specifically, and as we've discussed before, I'm not even, I can't even turn on my own television, so I didn't want to So I, 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 can, I can speak a little to it, um, and of course Ashok would speak to it better than I would, but this is for the core switch and the um, MDF, which is in all the buildings, which basically controls your internet infrastructure, if you if you will. Um, the core in the high school also connects to, the, the core switch in the high school also connects to the fiber loop that connects the town. Um, so these are at eight years old. The, the life is between seven and 10. So that's why the, the plan is to replace them. They're pushing towards end of life. So they're at eight years with an estimate of uh, a 10-year replacement. Okay. Any questions about that one? Okay. Um, and then the wetlands order of conditions. So this is something that has come to light um, over the course of talking, investigating the athletic field project, although it is, so this is a pre-existing obligation that the town has. Um, that, the, that the, the school department has from when the fields were initially built. So this <laughs> pre-exists all of us. Um, it's clearly something that somehow fell by the wayside over time and in the context of conversation with the CONCOM around the athletic field project, they, they realized that this was an outstanding obligation. So they have been really great in working with us, but feel firmly that this is something that needs to be taken care of before the next group of us retires and it's forgotten again. Um, they've reduced the obligation um, and the, the square footage of the project. Um, this is definitely something that the selectmen were interested in postponing. Um, so I just give you that in the spirit of full disclosure from having been at that meeting, but um, I think that that would present a challenge um, to the Conservation Commission in terms of the authenticity of our uh, commitment to getting it done. Uh, and it also um, came up, Jean, when we were looking at the cross-country project. Mm -hmm. So the cross-country track um, mm -hmm. that is only phase one has only been completed. Um, that project can also not move forward um, without this meeting this order of conditions. Um, and they're from 1995 or something like yeah. that, right? Yeah. 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 So, I so mean, had it we've been, been putting it off for kind of a while. We have. Somebody, yeah, I mean, uh, along the way, it Somebody somehow was. got forgotten. But yeah. had that been taken care of, there would have been no wetland impact to the athletic field. Mm -hmm. So it's not related to the athletic field process right. project. It's just that in in looking at any f looking for any outstanding order of conditions related to the school department in general. There was another one that um, that they discovered that Ralph actually <laughs> diligently pursued yes, and did. took care of before he retired. The missing signature. The missing signature yeah. on the as-builts for the loop road. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> anyway, that's the history and the context for that. And then finally, the AEDs um, for the athletic teams are in the pay-as-you-go. That article is 33000 and. Norman mentioned at the Board of Selectmen meeting on Tuesday that he thought there might be grant funding available for that. So I don't know if he has followed up with you about that, but certainly if they can be paid for by a grant, sure, that would be fantastic. Um, Do you know what Dee said about that? I feel like we asked her that question. I think I thought I was going to say I, I thought it came, came up, up when she presented it. Yep, I, I think, think so. I don't know if he thought maybe through the fire department or the FEMA or something. Okay. I have no yeah. idea, yeah. but okay. it's certainly worth a second question sure. if it could be free no or reduced. Yeah. And so I think this is for 26, and I do believe that Dee was able to access um, funding for maybe one. 
Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was it was small in terms of the of the, the quantity. Okay. Um, but you know, something like um, emergency management grant would be a potential. Yeah. So that would I think that would be great. Um, that said, I do think that, you know this isn't moving the conversation forward. That's another one I would feel very strongly about not postponing. Yeah, I feel like we should take that one right off the table. I mean, I, I can't imagine postponing those unless nope. I'm wrong, right? Yeah. Nope. That, that, yeah, that one stays. Yeah. Definitely we'll look into yeah. additional grant funding, however. Yes. And so then that brings us back up to the top, which is the turf field project, which I specifically skipped over because um, it is a bond. There will be some debt service impact if it goes forward, but we don't know what that is, and we're very close to getting our numbers, which we can provide <coughs> to town so that we can get more clarity around that. So I would just suggest, because we do have a large grant from CPC, there is community funding being sourced right now, and we don't know the tax impact, I would suggest that we just, you know, keep that one on a hold. The, and that one, to note, is, is more of a thematic discussion around what we actually want to go towards the town with because that's not only bonded that's going to be a debt exclusion exactly so, so the debt service you know, any debt service we pay we're not going to get any benefit towards Operating. the levy with respect to that right and also in fairness parks and rec has voted in in favor of this they have partnered with us on this project they are partnering with us on the management of this project they are taking sole responsibility for raising the revenue from these fields and so I certainly don't want to remove it from discussion without having a conversation with Parks and Rec. So it is on the school property but it is a community project um, and so again it's just an ongoing discussion on that one so I don't want to, I would suggest that we not take that one off the table today. Um, so I think that's a complete review of what we have on the table. Um, does anybody have thoughts about what what they could what we could reduce or postpone if it were going to alleviate some of the stress in the overall tax impact? So, so again, I just want to uh, you, you've already said this, but I just kind of want to frame this up a little bit. When we talk about impact to the operating budget to the levy, really. The pay-as-you-go articles are all currently slated to be paid for by free cash. Right. Typically, the town has not supported the idea of using free cash to pay for anything other than one-time expenses. So it's not it's not as if we could, so we could, as a, as a town, as a collective group of, of boards, elect to use free cash to pay some operating expense, but then that just sort of pushes the problem because then next year it, it, it's right. an increase if it's a recurring expense. So it, it's entirely, and then the bonded items are going to have a relatively small debt service in FY19 because even if we borrow for them, Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, we, we would just be the initial interest payment at most, right, that we'd see in FY19. I believe except for the fields in this case because they're going to be completed in fiscal year 19 mm -hmm. so therefore you probably pay the first year of debt service in, in 2019 and same thing I think but with the technology upgrades those are shorter borrowings I think those are over five years rather than well that's pay as you go um, oh, what about the what I'm about the, secure, the security the upgrades. security um, Mike would that be the same thing then for the campus road master plan because that would be completed in the summer as well so you're saying right so you'll take the first to you know the longer term projects that take several years the schools or the DPW they they've taken several years right. but ones that you're going to complete over this summer that you know the the year starts in uh, July so you, you'll be done by September so you'll start the borrowing will take place when the job is, is completed and it's a five-year bond you're saying those are usually five-year Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So, are you able to do that kind it's of not math? Not an insignificant no, amount of money. I, was just wondering I mean, not really. Math. Like, if it's a, I mean, I'm just figuring if it's a five-year bond, you just add up the ones that are five-year bond and divide by 
five to just get a level principal payment, but that's I mean that, that's like worse than back of the napkin in terms of actually figuring out how much we'd be paying. So, um, but the point is, if you add up all those bonding items that would be paid for on five years, I mean it's seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So I mean it's it's that hundred hundred fifty grand. I mean, it's not it's not small. Right, and I, I'd also have to say this is my opinion, but a lot of it may be because we're facing a 7.5% increase, even though it gets pushed out into years when you do the bonding. It could be more of a symbolic thinking, right. sort of, that you're like, okay, but, oh, it's not this year. Let's just push it off, and, and the whole idea is that that's why we're doing the long-range planning because um, we're just pushing all the borrowing into future years, and we're just not going to get back to where we want to be. So, but. For the most part, you are correct that when you do a bond, it, it's over a couple of years out, but, but they do add up. Mm -hmm. I agree with what you just said too, Mike, about, you know, I think we all have the instinct of like anything that we can postpone, we should because it's so critical, but I think it's also important to understand what the impact of that is and if that's going to end up costing us more money. And that is something that we're going to have to consider in terms of the turf field, having just put in a lot of money into the feasibility study and gone through you know, a year and a half worth of process. Um, if we have to go back out to bid again, there's going to be an additional cost with our, um, cert with our, with the, with Gale Associates and whatever. I, it, you know, so it's not like it's completely. There are financial impacts to postponing some of these as well. I guess is what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say, and just remind us of. Um, but I can't do any of that math fast enough in my head to tell you what it is. So. Um, I will say for myself, I will start the conversation by saying I'm comfortable postponing the dishwasher. It's not big money, um, but it is pay as you go. So I would be comfortable postponing the dishwasher. Um, and I don't think we need to vote um, on this. Uh, my suggestion, I don't know what you all think, but. I think once this all settles, we can just revote once because we've already reduced the bus contract, but not revoted it. And if we have to make further reductions, we'll have to vote. So rather than trying to keep track of <laughs> what vote we're on, I'd rather just do a summary at the end. But um, yeah, I'm feeling the general consensus. I'm the same way on the dishwasher. Okay. Especially with what I heard tonight. Yeah, I mean, it looks like both the, the recommendation is both the dishwasher and the AC the middle school, right, mm -hmm. that we postponed that. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of these things are needed, right, but I think I was hearing on the technology upgrades, for instance, is there room to move that? I'm just wondering. I would really rather wait to, to defer to Ashok okay. um, on that question. I think, Sue, thank you for that summary. Um, but I really cannot answer with any confidence what it would mean to defer even part of this as far as the demands on the system right. um, and how it supports the rest of his department. So right. I think we'd need to wait on, on checking in with him. And it would mean that we would be adding that cost to the FY20 yes. request, which right. we he does have it all mapped out. So there yeah. is an expected request in FY20. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, he's done a great job to balance it over time. So if we push that off for a year, it needs to be with the understanding that next year there will be a big spike in that particular article, which is kind of those, those two, technology and security, are kind of our standing articles. I'm particularly sensitive to things, too, that have a wider impact in the school. And uh, Susan, you mentioned that the course which the high school connects into the town-wide fiber. Mm -hmm. So by deferring that, we're not necessarily just creating, uh, we may not be creating a problem, right? It's, right? it's still within the usable life, but it has wider impacts right. than just the school. And so I would also offer that the HVAC replacements district-wide, the Elmwood gym gets used a lot and you know but as a town asset so that's another one that i think it's important to you know to to think about that it's not just a school usage if that if that other ac goes down that's an ac one right uh it's just the unit that controls all the air yeah. exchange right so Heating. that's that's going to be 
you know, I'm thinking about a bunch, number of town organizations that use that would ha that would have to find other locations because mm -hmm. I don't think you want like second grade rec basketball in an unheated gym. Mm -hmm. um, right. All of these sort of have that co potential cost. I feel like every single one of them. Like m maybe yeah, you could push it till next year, but if that one of those course switches goes down. I mean, everything the kids do are online. Not everything, but an enormous amount of, right? So suddenly they don't have access to... Yep, and we're increasing, we're cons constantly increasing demand right. based on so, uh, new devices. Right. Um, so, yeah, I feel like that one... We're in a place right now <coughs> where we, we really, we, we don't talk about this a lot and we don't, you know, want to stress it as a, a driver. Um, but it is true that we need to prepare our third graders to take the next generation MCAS online. Um, we have started a type to learn program at, at that level. Um, they need to be on um, keyboards. They need to be practicing. They need to be building up um, stamina as well as comfort level um, with those devices because that's how they're going to be expected to be tested. We have been able to continue to participate as paper participants. Um, I think this is our last year, oh, Carol, isn't it? I think it is. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that's another demand um, on the Elmwood School mm -hmm. in terms of supporting the increase to all of those devices. I, I, mean, it, I mean, honestly, I don't know if this, it, you know, talking about these in aggregate, I, you've zeroed out the two in amended request that I would feel comfortable zeroing out. I, I, I recognize right. that this is a tough year I, in, in a lot of challenges, but as we discussed, we're kind of not looking at the things that are really going to help our, hugely help our, our overall budget problem. Um, right, right. And, and again, as I said, if you take out some of those bondings, things start to add up, but um, but you can't, I mean, as we discussed, you can't, the security cameras are a necessity mm -hmm. and they have a downstream operational impact. The Campus Road Master Plan is, <laughs> we need parents to start adopting that new pick up and drop off mm -hmm. procedure without having to like physically block off the road um, and and the bus parking lot has a really beneficial impact right. from a revenue perspective I, yeah and I mean the walk-in refrigerator is twenty thousand dollars but you know, again operational impact I would imagine when the walk-in refrigerator and freezer goes down we throw out a lot of food yeah <coughs> so and, and we have to and, buy a new one right well and we're replacing the compressor <coughs> within the budget anyway yeah. because you yeah. have to right so I, it's not for lack of trying I just right. don't know where else we can go so what I think I'm hearing is we're willing to postpone the dishwasher we're willing to postpone the air conditioning at the middle school again which also isn't a really a great savings um, and if grant funding can be identified for the AEDs obviously we'd be happy to do that um, you know it sounds like you'll have a follow-up conversation with Ashok mm -hmm. about the technology, mm -hmm. um, but you know, if he's comfortable postponing it for one year, it means it's going to absolutely be added in to FY20, where mm -hmm. we already know that we have. I mean, typically we have a two hundred dollar, two hundred dollar, two hundred thousand dollar request. So mm -hmm. that's definitely a kicking of a can down yeah. the road. Um, yeah. And then the other one is the wetlands order of conditions. You know, I having been the person that worked directly with the CONCOM, I can't, I, I personally can't recommend that we postpone this. I know that's not going in the right direction. And I certainly, if it push comes to shove and that's a trade off between classroom teachers, I will have a different opinion. But right now, I'm not comfortable putting that on the list. That doesn't mean that the rest of you have to, you know, <laughs> feel constrained by my opinion. Um, I'd be willing, if it's something you mentioned, the Board of Selectmen asked a lot of questions about it. If that is a place that they want to go, then I would say I'd be willing to participate in a three-way conversation between us, the Board of Selectmen, and the CONCOM that I would have to imagine would involve a plan for how we're actually going to address that if I think taking it off you're right I think taking it off sends it, it not only might stifle some projects that we have ongoing right now but it also sends a terrible message to a, a committee that we work with because yeah. 
we we did everything above board we, and then pulled it. Right. I mean, um, right. So, but but I think if the selectmen, if for some reason that was identified as a really strong potential savings, and we all wanted to sit down and say, look, this year is this year, we're going to work out a plan, and this is how this is going to get addressed. I could see that being an option, but I, I would agree with you. I, right. I don't I don't see just pulling it. Um, mm -hmm. I could get comfortable with your recommendation, but I agree that I mean I just you know we we. We work really hard to be collaborative and, and work in good faith with other town boards, and I, I, mm -hmm. I don't want them to think otherwise. And so, okay. but that's a good suggestion, John. Yep, uh, I accept Very your good. friendly amendment. <laughs> On something we're not voting. That's right. <laughs> I just like to throw that word around because that's what we say at town meeting. All right. So um, I don't know. I I am sensing that that brings us to the end of our conversation around capital budget requests. Did you have any other questions or thoughts, Mike? Uh, no, I don't. Just because in the process that the school committee or the school board comes in front of the appropriations and we discuss and we get to ask, as a whole committee, we ask questions. So mm -hmm. I prefer not to give my one person's opinion mm -hmm. when the whole board weighs Okay. That, that, thank you. That's fair. Um, so that sounds like we have freed up. We have freed up $100,000 worth of pay as you go. No, we have freed up seventy five thousand mm -hmm. dollars of pay as you go on a contingency, assuming there's grant funding available, we have freed up another additional thirty three thousand mm -hmm. dollars if the board of selectmen feels strongly and is willing to work with us and the concom on a plan for addressing the wetlands order of conditions, we're willing to free up that additional postpone that additional hundred thousand dollar request and so that is two hundred thousand dollars and I mean from a money perspective it's cheating we could say yes and the two hundred thousand dollars for the AC at the middle score there you go four hundred thousand dollars but that's definitely not um, authentic to the request that has been made to us by this board yeah, it's probably like 35 40 because if you figure your first year borrowing on it Again, that just rough math divide by five. Okay, so 35 or 40? I just don't know what they're accounting for in terms of debt service for these projects in year one. That would be the only question I would have. Okay, so that would get us to potentially get us to um, $235,000, um, which means there would be another, you know, if they if they are sticking with their four hundred thousand dollar number, that would mean another hundred and seventy five thousand dollars worth of reductions to our operating budget. Can I throw in the bus excise task taxing in here? Oh, good point. Get credit. What for is that. the? Yeah, can we get credit for that? I wish I could remember the number because the, it was it came up during the um, center school reuse committee conversation as well, um, and Elaine had the number and she threw it out there and well, I don't remember the number that they throw around all the time is a hundred thousand dollars. We did talk about this on um, Tuesday at the board okay. of selectmen meeting, but Norman did say that that has not that that number has been out there for a long time. It has not right. really been um, recently reviewed and we do have an additional bus right now and I think so I asked per bus and so, I don't oh, remember okay. what it I was per I, bus. I did uh, recently just send an email to um, um, Norman asking to calculate based on current excise the number of buses I gave him the number of buses and the, and, and the size okay. isn't there potentially so larger impact than of even the next size in the fuel consumption costs mm -hmm. for us in a reduction in our budget for travel or yeah. we um, took the fuel clause out altogether anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like that. Okay. But I think that X size has a double whatever the number is should be doubled because we are saving that payment to Ashland and then adding that I guess it's an no, out of zero. Never it. mind. Oh, but still. No, we don't. Does Connolly pay it? No, con yeah, yeah, the bus don't, company. Yeah. We don't pay it. No, it comes from the vendor. Okay. All right. So never. But we should still get credit for the revenue. revenue. Right. Correct. Right. 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 I like that. So whatever that number is helps a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So they they would, 
I, like I said, I, I asked Mr. Kamala to give us a, okay. a reset on a calculation because I don't know where that number, I know there's been a historical number thrown around. I don't know where that number came from. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. All right. So um, is that the direction that we want to give to Dr. McLeod for, for working with her admin team over the vacation? $175,000 and understanding what would be the prog programmatic and service impact to that amount of a reduction. I guess so. That's fine. Okay. So um, I am going to do my best to summarize all of this in an email that I'm going to run past. Uh, the two of you before I send tomorrow because okay. I want to make sure I got all my math right yeah. and said all the right said things all the right way. Um, so that would be great, Jean, because what I'll need to um, understand from my notes here and my follow up is whether the 175 is in addition to my questions on, for example, grant funding for AED, or if we were able to take that off the table. Does the 33 come off the 175? No, that I counted the 33 as in. a given. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we can. I don't think we can. I, I because I think we've explored grants, and I think yes, I will ask the question. But even if there can be funding for maybe an AED, coming up with 33,000 is going to be very unlikely. So I just I, I think our seemed, number is closer to 200. He seemed very confident that he could cover that when I. So I know okay. you guys tried. If he has different sources. Okay. I mean, I suppose if you if you can do two hundred, then mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. add the. I mean, I back think in. I don't even know if these numbers are going to be acceptable to them anyway. If they're going right. to see the calculations the way that we do. Well, well I mean, I, so yeah, I mean, part of it is the sourcing, right? Like, if we can't use free cash for anything else, then it's sort of irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. Right. Then then the number's four hundred right. <laughs> at that point. So, all right. So so we're going to work with a number for two hundred. Okay. Um, but if he could quickly answer the question about the grant for the AED, yeah. then you could reduce that number to 175. Right. I also have a question for Ashok um, to follow up on. So if I'm understanding correctly, this <clears throat> the school committee is looking for um, some potential recommendations and program impact on the way I'm seeing it, more than one program. So we'll talk about, we'll look at different places we can go. I like what you said earlier, Jean, and I think it's something that we need to remember is that this is temporary. We're not looking for, a, you are not at this point looking for a recommendation to reduce a program that we'll never be able to fund again, but, but for a one year recommendation right now. Um, and for me, in my way of thinking, that would include um, us looking at many different possibilities and then sharing um, that information with you for additional discussion, which makes me think that we might want to meet again before the 26th. So I, I have one question here. Um, let's say a show gives a response that is to the tune of 165. Would that cover uh, the 400000 that we are looking to meet? And, and we don't know the answer. So I know right. I can say with certainty that it would not be the, the entire 165. Okay. Okay. Um, he okay. has already, as we've said, um, reduced and, and kind of little by little, I think it was at 200 at one point. I believe so. Um, and I think mm -hmm. he's reduced as far as he can while still maintaining mm -hmm. the integrity. But I... So if we were to reduce that, Mina, I believe, you know, we might be able to squeeze another 15 out of it. It would certainly not be anywhere close to what we're being asked to come up with. But I will ask that of him because anything that we can reduce here means less on the, um, the operating. Right? I mean, I'm okay. not in favor of, um, you know, I'm just speaking for myself, I'm not in favor of reducing you know, the, the service that is provided. Right. And 
cutting on programs. I'm not. I, I think we've already seen that with the ceramics program, and you know, uh, I would not want to see that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I don't know where else the money, um, you know, where else the adjustment could be. So, right. I, so I think it, it's a, it's a bit of a collaborative exercise that we're going through. But um, I would echo that. I, I think personally, as one member of, of one of these boards that's trying to solve this problem, I, I think we do a better job spending time educating the public as to why the increase is as significant as it is and why. You know, and the components of that seven percent increase. I think, from a school perspective, I, I don't think we have anywhere else to go, and I don't think we'd be meeting people's expectations if we cut services. No, so. and I and I believe that that's the message that we've been yeah. providing, including the fact that the school committee certainly hasn't heard any recommendations from from us to reduce services. Um, however. My takeaway from the joint meetings, and I believe an expectation going into next Monday, or the 26th, is that we are prepared um, to at least have examined if there, if there were to be any recommendations, where that might be. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly difficult thing for us to even begin to look at, and we all agree with what you said, Mina. Um, but the other side of that is I don't think we can continue to come with nothing. I agree. I mean, you know, I, I really do understand and appreciate from the Board of Selectmen's perspective that, you know, it's easy to talk about percentages and money when you don't, when it's not representing a real service. Yep. And so I, I do applaud the desire to concretely understand what the impacts would be of reducing the overall tax um, increase from 7% to 5%, which is the goal that they talked about most recently. Mm -hmm. what, where, what I wrestle with is the impact that that exercise has on the service on the people who both provide those services mm -hmm. and receive those services. Mm -hmm. And I have been here long enough to have gone through budgets that were where we had a 0.75% increase, where we had to implement fees for the first time ever, where we looked at in eliminating our extracurricular drama program at the middle school, which we refused to do. But I have seen firsthand parents coming out in droves so angry about even broaching the topic. Yeah. Um, I have seen parents waving their checkbooks saying, I will pay you directly for this service. It's that important to my children. Um, I have seen teachers leave to go to other districts and administrators leave to go to other districts because they don't feel that there's um, stability when we're having that kind of volatility in our budget. So I, I really understand and we're all an elected board and we have to have these conversations in public for everyone to see and there's value in that but I just you know I don't want to be seen to be dragging our feet but I until the, the direct instruction is that all town departments are unfortunately going to have to reduce services I'm really afraid to put on the table what those would be. Mm -hmm. Th that's what I'm wrestling with in terms of do I think that you need to go through that exercise next week? Absolutely I do. It's my understanding that that's the exercise that all the town departments are going through. The difference is that is a conversation that one department head can have with the town manager or with the people that work for him, but that's a conversation that it's incumbent on us to have in the public and that impacts our teachers, our students, our parents. And that's where I just, mm -hmm. I, I feel very uncomfortable saying if we have to reduce, this is what we're going to do. Because mm -hmm. if we don't have to do that, that that just, it was done at quite a cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Exactly. Correct. So in terms of why I'm going on my soapbox about that is I don't know what to say about posting another meeting mm -hmm. and discussing this. I think we should have this information prepared certainly by Monday for the joint meeting but I don't know if I think that we should meet before that to discuss it because if 
you know, at the joint meeting that we had before, the direction was different than it was. It was go find $1.2 million. Then at the last one, it was go find $400,000, but don't cut staff. So I don't know if there's going to be a different direction. I don't want to have... I think this exercise tonight has shown that there's nowhere to go except staff. We know from our presentation and you know from the expense increase that there's nothing there. That we have no new initiatives, we have no new programs um, right. that we're funding. The overall, um, uh, the slide that shows the budget, yeah, you, you're, Sue's going there. Um, yeah. The budget driver summary, exactly. That slide shows the very last, um, there we go, uh, other expenses, technology, curriculum, and regular education come up to a measly 0.25%. We're not adding anything that would, would have any impact to it reduction unless it's going to be personnel. So I think the painful discussion is none of us want to make that recommendation. The Board of Selectmen doesn't want to start seeing personnel reduced. And it it's interesting, right, because sometimes the word that is used is teacher. Um, but to us, they're all educators. They, they all contribute to the total program. And so I think what we're saying tonight, and we are consistent, is that there is no, people need to understand when they ask us to go into operating that what they are asking us to do is to, to decrease personnel. And that is gonna impact on program. And so perhaps, as I'm fast forwarding and thinking about Jean's question about needing to meet, maybe what comes out of it is we go ahead and put our heads together along with our team um, and maybe what the directive ends up being is X number of dollars. Um, and for us to figure out then going forward where that's gonna come from. But as Jean has said repeatedly, once we start talking publicly about program, even if we end up not having to do it, it is at such a cost to that particular program. Mm -hmm. um, we value every single tiny piece of this complicated budget that we have put together and that I have recommended and you have accepted. And so going back to any part of it is gonna be very, very painful. Um, maybe that's what our work needs to be, is asking all of those questions and knowing where we might have to go, um, but mm -hmm. avoiding calling out any specific program, rather continuing to work with the boards, the town boards, to together determine if this is the direction that we are going in with, within our town in order to not increase taxes. We understand it means reducing somewhere. Well, and the other thing too, as I was listening to you talk, the other thing that's gonna, there's another new piece of information that we're gonna have mm -hmm. at that Monday meeting is the forecast that we just did, mm -hmm. which shows this year mm -hmm. is, as Anomaly. we said, particularly challenging mm -hmm. and we go back to a more traditional mm -hmm. or more consistent with previous, you know, most recent history level increase. We don't know what that looks like on the town side. And if it's similar on the town side or, you know, be optimistic if there's great news on the town side, that may inspire the Board of Selectmen to, to change their messaging and say, listen, everybody, this is just going to be a horrible year and it will stabilize after that. And maybe they then will not pick the number 5% and they will pick the number 5.5% or 6% or, I don't know, 7%. Um, so, you know, all the more reason why I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to have a meeting beforehand to talk okay. about specifically what you so would recommend if you were requested, because the number might change. Okay. And yep. so, having said that, what I am wondering is, um, based on our conversation today with the town manager and the chair of the board of selectmen, my understanding is that we have our joint meeting on the twenty sixth. They have a meeting on the twenty seventh, where originally the plan was that they're going to vote their budget and forward it to appropriations. But what they said was, and I'm looking for a nod of uh, approval or recognition from you, that they had had a conversation with appropriations 
and that you understood that you might have to give them a little extra time, assuming that they would you would get better numbers. So if that is true and there's a little wiggle room in terms of that schedule, that would still allow us the opportunity to have a meeting after the January 26th meeting. And if we can get clarity at that meeting about, you know, based on all this other information that they're still gathering, <clears throat> what the number is, then we can have a meeting, then we can have a public conversation <coughs> about what that's going to mean yeah. in terms of an impact to the schools and services, um, and still stick on what's the amended timeline, I guess, mm -hmm. or assuming that they're going to amend the timeline. We could even post a meeting for the 27th that was, you know, Tuesday. Concurrent with their meeting. Join yeah. with it. I don't know. We have a meeting on the 1st also, right? We do. We do. So that would be three meetings that week for us. <laughs> you know, I think to your point, though, any mm -hmm. recommendations that okay. would be made to the school committee coming out of the 26th could be made on the 1st. The meeting you already have is that later than you're expecting to get i guess i haven't received specific instructions but typically what i've seen in the past is the the board of selectmen will still approve a budget to go to the appropriations committee with the idea of finding five hundred thousand reducing five hundred thousand or some number that they would like mm. to see and we still move on as we move toward Never done that the goal is that we'd like to do it earlier because we always end up right before town meeting still trying to figure this all out and I think we're trying to avoid that right. but we're still pretty early on in this budget where we do have wiggle room um, the latest charter you know obviously you know the timeline has been moved up quite a bit but uh, we do have it's earlier now but we still have time to to try to reduce it mm -hmm. We have a public forum on the 27th, Gene, the Math Pathways. Okay. So that's a meeting that will involve many of us. Yeah. All right. So let's let's do that. Well, just to recap, because I, <laughs> I've had the experience at a couple of meetings recently that not, I didn't feel like I had clear direction when I left. So okay. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I am going to write a summary email to send to the Board of Selectmen, which will include our forecast presentation um, that we got tonight. It will offer that after careful review of our capital budget requests we can comfortably postpone the dishwasher we can comfortably postpone the air conditioning at the middle school which we estimate might save about thirty five thousand dollars in debt service in fy19 um, we cannot postpone the campus paving but would like to point out that that should generate the current estimate is $100,000 in revenue, but we've asked for clarification on that. Um, assuming that Norman is, is able to identify the grant that he referred to on Tuesday for the AEDs, obviously we would reduce that. Kathy will follow up with Ashoke regarding if there's anything in the technology request that can be postponed for a year, and if um, the Board of Selectmen would work with us and CONCOM on a plan to address the wetlands replication. We would be willing to have a conversation about postponing that one. Other th uh, beyond that, what we have directed the superintendent to do is to work with her team next week to identify a reduction of $200,000 to the operating budget. I should also add in here the bus contract reduction um, just so we have everything all in one place I know we've already done that um, an additional two hundred thousand dollar reduction to our operating budget we will not have reviewed that we will not have the opportunity to review that prior to that meeting but based on the results of the meeting on January 26 should that reduction be necessary we will place it on the agenda for our March 1st meeting and review it at that time okay does that okay so that is my job. Your job is much harder. Mm -hmm. And um, we did not adjourn by 8.50. Um, 
All right, well, you know, thank you all. This is really hard. Um, this is a tough first budget year. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. they're I'm not so all like this. I'm so with all the work um, that Susan, um, Ms. Rothbridge, and her team did to put these projections. I, I think that uh, it's a lot of work in there. So all right, sorry. does anybody else have any additions? Okay, I think we can then move on to our final opportunity for public comment. Mr. Manning, you have anything you'd like to say? <laughs> no public comment. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so all that we have that remains is items by consensus. Is there anything that anyone would like to pull out for separate consideration? Um, okay. Jean, I'm sorry, because I might not have been paying attention. Did you already do that? Yes, okay. I did. Um, okay, so Dr. McLeod. Yes, the superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. And any new motion? So moved. And a second? Second. So a motion by um, Mina, a second by Jen. All in favor? Yes. 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 And I, um, just for the minutes taker, I should have noted earlier, but Mrs. Kavanaugh had to step out of the meeting earlier at 816. So there are four of us now. Um, so that was four to one with Ms. Kavanaugh being absent. Um, so now I am looking for a motion to adjourn the meeting at 929. So moved. Second. Okay. So a motion by um, Jen, a second by Mina. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so thank you all very much. I will. I hope you have a wonderful vacation. I know yours is going to be more difficult than ours, but I hope there's a little time to relax and reflect, and we will reconvene on the 26th. So thank you, as always, to HCAM, and that's it. Ha, 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 ha.